Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is the International Space Station. Yes, we're ready for the event. Monrovia Unified School District, this is Mission Monrovia. Control Houston. Please call the station for a voice check. Station, this is Shelly Bonus here with Monrovia High School. How do you hear me? Monrovia High School, we have you loud and clear. Greetings aboard the International Space Station from the crew of Expedition 34. I'm Kevin Ford along with Tom Marshford and Chris Hadfield. We are happy to talk to you today. Great. Hi, I'm... Hi, I'm Sonia. How do you digest your food without gravity? Well, I'm glad we can. I, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know exactly how it works, but uh, I know like when I'm in bed at night, I can still digest my food. My organs have a way of processing the food that works without the, the help of gravity. It is a little bit different. It takes a little while for our bodies to get used to being up here. Um, my, my digestive system wasn't exactly uh, normal after I got here for several weeks, and it's always been a little bit different than Earth, but I feel good, and uh, I, I can digest all my food. We have to eat a lot more up here, it seems to me, than I do on Earth. So I think there are still some mysteries left, and hopefully one of these days all the smart scientists will figure it all out, maybe like you. Hello. I'm Jack. Is it always night and never day on the, on the ISS? Also, what language do you use since it's an international space station? Well, you know, Jack, we go through 16 sunrises and sunsets a day. We're going 17,500 miles an hour. So that means time on the space station could be any time we want to. So between all the international partners, we decided we're going to use Greenwich Mean Time. And the ground sets our schedule, and they tell us when it's time to go to sleep and when to wake up. So that's how we do it. But we can't look outside and tell. Uh, right now, the, uh, the official language that we use on the space station is English. But we love learning Russian and uh, speaking Russian with our Russian colleagues. We work a lot of our procedures in Russian. And about a third of the time, we're speaking Russian. And uh, if there's an international partner up here from Japan or from, uh, from any of the countries in Europe, then uh, we'll hear that language as well. It's a lot of fun learning new languages up here. Hi, my name is Angel. What do you miss most about Earth and why? Hi, Angel. Uh, you know, it, it's a really interesting place to work up here. We are busy. There are experiments. The view out the window is unbelievable. But it's not the same as, as being on Earth. And I think for me, I, I don't know what the, the other crew members think, but the, for me, the thing I miss the most is just the, the physical contact of, of living with family and friends on Earth, the, the hugging and handshakes and, and uh, just being with people around that, uh, you know, that you know and you love. Um, this is a good, hardworking crew. We have lots of stuff to do, but, uh, but everyone likes you know, being welcomed and close to family. And I think that's one of the things I'll really look forward to when I get home, is just hugging my kids and my wife and, and seeing people and, and that uh, physical contact of being around uh, everybody that you love all the time. Hi, I'm Kalani. What is it like to float in space? Well, we can show you how happy it makes us. How's this? <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's um, very unusual at first. Uh, imagine, imagine if you found yourself just floating at home, or imagine how, what your pet would think if it found itself floating. Uh, it's a little crazy uh, the first time it happens to you, and you're a little insecure. You, you want to grab a hold of things. You want to have pressure on your feet, or when you sit down, you'd like to have pressure on your backside. But we never have that up here. Even when we're sleeping, we're floating almost touching nothing. And uh, I would say it's a lot like being in warm 
warm water in a pool or something, if you close your eyes and imagine just floating and having no pressure points on you anywhere. Uh, so it's really unusual uh, after you get used to it and you think about it, it's really a lot of fun. You can just pick a corner of the room and float up into that corner and enjoy floating back down. And of course, we like to play a lot of games up here in zero G. So there are a lot of advantages to being up here. I don't think you'd want to do it forever because we, we are really engineered and made for gravity. And I like running around and walking through parks and stuff like that. So there are things I miss about Earth. I even miss gravity about Earth. But I do like floating around for, uh, for the time I've been up here for four and a half months or so. My name is Jared, and what do you during, do during your free time on the ISS? Well, everybody's uh, got their favorite thing to do during free time. We don't have a lot of it. Uh, some of us like to play guitar, some of us like to read, but I, one thing everybody loves to do, and that's to look out the window. We've got the most spectacular view I can imagine. Uh, being 250 miles above the Earth, so we're always looking for interesting, beautiful landforms. We're uh, looking for cities that we recognize, even new cities we've never been to. And we've learned an incredible amount about the geography of the Earth and what it really looks like, not just what it looks like on a map. So probably the, the most popular thing to do in our spare time is to look out the window. Hi, my name is Grant. What inspired you to become an astronaut? Hey, Grant, um, you're going to grow up to be something, guaranteed. You're going to grow up to be something. And the question is, you know, how's that going to happen? And who and what are you going to grow up to be? And it's really up to you. You're the product of the, the decisions that you make. And for me, uh, when I was your age, I was inspired by the very first people who left Earth and walked in another heavenly body, another planet, the first two people who walked on the moon. Uh, and their names were uh, Ed and Neil, uh, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong. And to me, I just thought, you know, it's, it, it was up until yesterday, it was impossible to walk on the moon. And now people have done that. And I thought, who knows what's going to be possible for me, but I'm going to start getting ready. I'm going to start thinking about things that I can do, that maybe someday I could do something like that. And over the last 40 years, I turned myself into an astronaut like we all did here, and give us a chance to do something like this. And it was because of those people who inspired me. Hi, I'm Emily. How do you emotionally prepare your mind to go into space for so long? <laughs> Hi, Emily. That, that's a really great question. Staying in space for uh, five or six months is very challenging. Uh, we know before we volunteer, of course, that we're going to be here this long. And it's something, uh, it's something we just set our sights on. When I, when I was uh, thinking about coming, I was thinking about how many weekends I had up here. I have about 22 or 23 free weekends. The rest of the time, I'm really working hard, and the days just are flying by. And what would I like to do with those weekends? And to me, 22 or 23 weekends in space didn't seem like very many to me. So frankly, the time has flown by for me, and I didn't expect it to seem long. But for those things where you, you have to might, like I might get an extension and spend maybe more months in space, and uh, when I have to face something like that, I just kind of face it one day at a time, and I realize that, um, you know, if I have to be someplace that I wouldn't want to be for a long time, I love being here, but if it was something that I wanted to get through, that each day or each hour is just, uh, it's that much shorter for me that I have remaining. If I have to do a long run for exercise or something like that. So it's just kind of a mental game I play with myself, and I, I'm, I'm used to uh, handling those kinds of challenges, those, those long challenges when they come. Hi, my name is Steven, and why doesn't the space station run out of oxygen? You know why? It's because of a lot of very smart people that planned and uh, building uh, this spaceship. And uh, that's why we, we need a nation with a lot of uh, knowledge and history, a spacefaring nation, to be able to figure these things out. So uh, we bring up air in tanks, and there's oxygen in there. We also have brought up liquid oxygen in tanks that's sitting on the outside of the space station. That's really precious uh, liquid there. We don't want to use that very much. But we have a lot stored up here if we need it. Well, one of the coolest things, I think, is the oxygen we breathe in and then breathe out again, and that comes out in, the, in our sweat. 
that's all grabbed by the system of the space station, and they take those oxygen molecules back out, those systems do, and uh, put it back into the air so we can rebreathe a lot of that oxygen. So we use up just a little bit. We have supplies on board, but we reuse a lot of the oxygen as well. It's a brilliant engineering system, and it's uh, really proud to be a part of it. Hi, I'm Gregory. What have you discovered in space that has surprised you? Uh, you know, I've, this was my third space flight, and on the previous two flights, I tried to tell people afterwards just how beautiful it is, what an amazing experience, a new experience it is. But on this flight, because of, of new technology that uh, NASA has put up here, we can send uh, pictures and sounds and things from the space station almost right away to the Earth so that people can really start to see this new thing that people are doing. And because of that, because of all the different ways, the social media and, and like talking to you today, uh, what's really surprised me is the huge amount of reaction to that. The hundreds of thousands of people all around the world that are directly following what we're doing here, really interested in what we're doing and actually making it part of their lives. So I think the thing that surprised me the most and that, that I really like is the huge um, support and interest in this new human exploration of space that we're part of. My, hi, my name is Phoebe, and what is the best part about being in a low-gravity environment? Well, uh, the floating is really, really fun. Like we said before, uh, your food floats, your microphone floats and uh, your friends float. But uh, what the coolest thing I think is um, are the experiments that we can do in this really, it's, it's all, it's for all practical purposes, zero gravity. And we can do things with fluids. We can watch a glob of water react in front of us or we can watch it inside, inside a very expensive and intricate chamber to study fluid flow dynamics. Uh, we can study combustion where um, things are burning in an environment where the gravity doesn't force airflow. Because uh, on the Earth, there's a, a phenomenon called convection. When things burn, it pulls air in from one side. And without feeding it air, it burns differently. And we have combustion racks up here and fluids racks. And we can study the way uh, we behave, or we, we age and we change in the microgravity environment and the way uh, plants and animals do also. So there's just many things you can study without gravity gravity that can tell us a lot about the intricate details of the way things work on Earth. We can either take them back to Earth or we can use them as uh, knowledge no learned for uh, future space flights. So that's really the coolest thing about being out here. Hi, my name is Eve and what do you do in case of an emergency? Hi, Eve. We've got that all planned out right now. And uh, what we can do is, uh, the main thing we can do is use our Soyuz, our spaceship that brought us up here. We always have that sitting on the outside dock, ready to bring us home if we need it in case of an emergency. But first, we take a lot of steps. And we've trained quite a bit with our Russian colleagues, uh, with all of our crewmates, to make sure that we know how to get oxygen if we need it, to, to uh, protect the space station if we need to, in case we have an emergency on board. So if none of that works, and there's a lot that we can do to help the, save the space station and keep ourselves safe, but if none of that works, we can go straight to our Soyuz and get home if we need to. Hi, my name is Carolina, and what is the most important job on the space station? Carolina, I think the most important job in the space station is always the one you're doing right now. In, in, because you can mess everything up with one little mistake. And even something you don't think is important. Let's say you're uh, just taking a picture at the window with your camera and you, uh, you inadvertently bump the window with your camera and put a big scratch in the window. Every astronaut, every picture taken from that moment on is going to have to live with that scratch. 
or even if you're just going to the bathroom and if you do something wrong, we have a careful sequence to make our space toilet work. If you mess something up there and you mess up the toilet on the space station, it seems like nothing important, but boy, it, it has a real impact on life on station. And that's one of the things you have to constantly remind yourself as an astronaut is there's nothing more important than the thing that you're doing right now. Hi, my name is Evan, and what does it feel like during liftoff? Well, uh, that is like one of my favorite things I've ever done in my life as liftoff. Uh, I was a pilot before I became an astronaut, and I love flying fast things. I got to fly fighter aircraft, and the acceleration you get from the afterburners and the engines is very similar to the feeling you get on liftoff. We climb into the rocket, and in the case of both the space shuttle and the Soyuz rocket that I flew up here in, you, you lie on your back. It's like lying on the floor, maybe with your feet up on a stool or something, and um, you're just waiting, and when the rocket finally lights, it starts to push you away. And it's like being in a car that's accelerating. It's pushing you back, backwards, and you feel vibrations. You feel the rocket moving a little bit left and right and a little bit up and down. And as you get lighter and lighter because the fuel is being used up, you get more and more and more pushing until you're way, you feel like you weigh three times what you weigh on Earth's surface. And then sometimes you get staging and a new rocket starts. And then you'll, you, the Gs will let up a little bit and you'll feel heavy but not as heavy and then they build up up again. And then when you finally get into space and the rocket shuts down, you're instantly in, in zero gravity and you're floating. So it's a very dynamic part of the flight. It's a very fun part of the flight. It's very intense and uh, we, we love doing it. It's an adrenaline rush um, and I'd love to do it more, but, uh, but it's a very expensive and special thing to get to do. So uh, that's, that's what it's like and uh, I hope you get to do it someday. Hi, my name is Nicholas. What is the process like to go through the atmosphere into outer space? Well, uh, Kevin described what it feels like. Uh, you know, it, it all starts sitting on the launch pad after at least two and a half years of training just for that flight. So that's the first step in the process. But once the rocket brings you up, one thing you can feel going through the atmosphere that's, that's very interesting is the computer in the rocket is constantly recalculating uh, the orbit that you've got to, to get to, the target that you're heading for. And you can feel that. You can feel the engine moving a little bit under the direction of the computer. And it's almost like a speedboat. If you've ever been in, in a boat on a lake going over wakes, just bouncing on top of the waves. Uh, so you can feel kind of a bounce, a rhythmic bounce, as the uh, rocket's figuring out uh, where to put you in space. Uh, you can feel a little bit of the turbulence of the air, and then uh, as soon as you get out of the atmosphere, the push from behind from the acceleration of the rocket is, is nice and smooth, and as Kevin mentioned, it's just a, a huge pressure, kind of a gorilla on your chest. You, you're taking your breaths in, in sips at that point, um, and it's just a push all the way up until the main engine cutoff. Hi, my name is Farah. How do you wash your clothes in outer space? Hi, Farah. Uh, well, how do you wash your clothes on Earth? Normally, you, you put them in a washing machine, and then a lot of water comes in, all the soap gets in, mixes it all up. That soapy water goes somewhere, and then more clean water comes in, rinses them. That goes somewhere, and then more clean water comes in for a final rinse. It takes a lot of water to wash clothes. And, and then what do you do with all that soapy, dirty, used water? You need a great big processing plant. Well. We could do that on the space station. We could figure out a space washing machine, but it's just not efficient, the, the weight and the cost and the complexity of it. So we found it's actually just simpler just to not wash our clothes. And in fact, we just wear our clothes until they get dirty, and then we throw them away. And it's not as gross as it sounds, because number one, we never sit down or lie down in our clothes. So you never lie on your clothes. Your clothes just sort of float on you. So they don't get rubbed against your body and get dirty nearly as quickly. Also, the space station's a big clean place. So you hardly ever get dirt or grease or anything on your clothes. And so it's really not too bad. Um, and uh, we have a supply of new clothes. Um, 
and it's cheaper and easier that way than it is to try and figure out a way to properly wash them. So if you're an astronaut, you just throw your dirty clothes away. Hi, my name is Cameron. Who flies to space? Okay, I think uh, I think yeah, the who who flies the spaceship when uh, we're asleep, the ground control is always watching over our spaceship. In fact, the uh, the International Space Station is really operated by a team on the ground and controlled through satellite. There are onboard computers that also uh, monitor it in case ground can't talk to the space station. It has it has kind of an automatic mode that it's flying in. It knows what it's supposed to be doing in the computers. Uh, continue to fly it. There are computers in the Russian segment watching the computers in the U.S. segment and they, they, they agree on what should be done and that's the way it's controlled. So if anything needs to change, like we would need to turn to a different attitude, maybe for a rendezvous or docking or something, then the ground control will put that in and it flies itself. So normally we don't on board actually control it. It's all controlled by the fantastic team on the ground who's down there supporting us all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all year round. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Station copies. We had a. There you go. Thank you, Monrovia High School, a Unified High School District Station. We are now resuming operational audio communications.